Okay, well, it's a very great pleasure to have Richard Garner from Macquarie University, the Centre of Australian Category Theory, um, to talk to us about the variety of Cartesian closed varieties. Thank you very much, Richard. Over to you. Thank you, Stephen. Um, and it's a pleasure to speak to you all. So I'm going to speak about something which is really universal algebra. And so we're going to start by reminding you about varieties. So variety is just the class of models of some equational algebraic theory. So like the theory of groups or the theory of vector spaces or the theory of Boolean algebras and so on. Now I'm a category theorist, so actually I really think of a variety as a category of models where the morphisms are the homomorphisms between the, the T models. And in that vein, I would call a variety Cartesian closed if the category of models uh, was Cartesian closed. And so what does that mean? It means that if I take two T models, Y and Z, then there's a new T model, which I write as Z to the Y, which I call the internal HOM from Y to Z, with the property that there's a bijection between homomorphisms from X times Y, so the product of T models, Cartesian product into Z, and homomorphisms from X into Z to the Y. So if we start with the most boring possible variety, the variety of sets, then this Z to the Y is just the usual function space. And I guess the question is, what other varieties do we have that are Cartesian close? So one example is the variety of G sets, sets with an action by a group G, and we'll see various other examples in a minute. So an obvious question to ask is whether you can characterize those varieties which are Cartesian closed, and their answer is yes, you can. And so these were characterized by the Topos theorist, Peter Johnston, in uh, a paper called Collapsed Toposes and Cartesian Closed Varieties, which is in the Journal of Algebra from 1990. And I'm not gonna tell you what collapsed toposes are, but I'm gonna tell you about Peter's characterization of Cartesian Closed Varieties. And it's a completely syntactic characterization and so what I'm going to give you is, well, I'll, tell you, I'll explain Peter's characterization to you, but then I'll show you a neater reformulation of it, and from which we can deduce all sorts of interesting things, in particular, the slightly amazing fact that the totality of Cartesian closed varieties themselves form a variety, and a variety which is actually kind of reasonably well known. Okay, so let's get going. So first of all, I'm going to show you some examples of Cartesian closed varieties. I mentioned the variety of sets and the variety of G sets. And so these examples here are going to be, again, kinds of sets equipped with some kind of action. So this here, I've got M sets. So this generalizes completely obviously the notion of a G set. So a G set is a set equipped with an action by a group. So an M set is a set equipped with an action by a monoid. And so if M is a monoid, which you might also call a unital semigroup, then an action of M on a set X is just, well, I have an M and an X and I get an M dot X. And if I act by the unit element, then that doesn't do anything. And then the action is associative, as you see here. So this is a Cartesian closed variety. So if I've got two M sets, X and Y, then I can form a new M set, Y to the X, and that's given, its underlying set is just the collection of all homomorphisms from X times m, so here m is the m set m equipped with a regular action, so the homomorphism from x times m into y. And so to make this set here into an m set, I equip it with this action here, which I won't go through, and this reduces to, um, in the case of g sets, um, what happens is this internal HOM reduces to just the set of functions between my two g sets with an action by kind of conjugation. All right, so that's M sets, but on the other hand, we have B sets. So here, B is a Boolean algebra. And so I can define what I mean by an action of a Boolean algebra on a set. So that means I take a Boolean algebra, an element of my Boolean algebra, and two elements of my set, and I'm going to produce a new element of my set. So B, X, Y goes to B brackets X, Y, and I think of this as if B, then X, else Y. Okay? So I have attributed this to um, George Bergman in 1991, but actually it goes back much further than that to John McCarthy, the father of Lisp. Um, but Bergman was the first person to write down the axiomatization. And so there are two axioms. If false, then X else Y gives me Y. 
And then this says if, and this is the Boolean implication A arrows B. So if A arrows B, then X else Y can be obtained by a nested if then statement in this way. Okay. And so what's the internal HOM for these things? I'm telling you these are a Cartesian closed variety. Well, X to the Y is just going to be the set of all homomorphisms of B sets from X to Y. And then there's some action by the Boolean algebra B, which I'm not going to go through here. Okay. So this is actually an example of a commutative variety. And so this is a familiar formula for a commutative variety. All right. So we can actually characterize the theories of M sets and B sets. So for M sets, it's pretty easy. If I've got an algebraic theory T, then I can say when it's the theory of M sets, well, it would be the theory of M sets if it's generated by unary operations, okay? And in that case, I can find out what the monoid is. It's just going to be given by this thing here, which is the set of all unary operations. So I'm going to write T of 1 for the set of all unary operations of my algebraic theory. OK? All right. And so on the other hand, I can characterize uh, a theory of B sets. And so I can say that T is the theory of B sets for some B. If and only if, it's a commutative theory and it's generated by these so-called hyper-affine operations. So first of all, what does it mean to say that a theory is commutative? Well, it means that if I take an operation F, and then here I've said this, so F here is, say, an operation that takes n variables, and so I'm using lambda notation to indicate that in the ith variable, I'm going to put this term here. And so similarly here, G, I use this lambda notation to indicate that in the jth variable slot of G, I'm going to put Xij, and so this thing here tells me that if I do F outside G, that's the same as doing G outside F. Okay. All right. And so examples of commutative theories are things like the theory of uh, K modules over a commutative ring, or uh, that's one of the most important examples. Um, maybe I'll stop there. So, and then what do I mean by saying, so that's commutative, what do I mean by hyper-affine operations? So I'm going to say that an operation is hyper-affine if, first of all, it's affine, which means that when I set all of its arguments to be the same, I just get back x. So you can imagine in a, uh, in a meat semi-lattice, the operation of meat is affine because x meet x equals x. But then hyper-affine says this thing here, that if I take f, and in the ith slot I put f applied to the thing which in the jth slot is xij, then I can sort of diagonalize that and say that's the same as applying f to the set of variables xii. Okay? All right. And in this case, we can recover the b for which this commutative hyper-affine theory is the theory of b sets by just looking at the set of binary operations. Okay? All right, now this slide is incredibly dense. I'm not going to go through it in any detail because you'll all hate me if I do. Um, but this is really just to show you what Peter's, Peter Johnston's characterization of these Cartesian closed varieties is. Okay, so I might just talk you through one or two things on this slide, but it's mainly just to show you that it looks a bit complicated. Okay. So what does, uh, what does Peter say? So he first of all defines an auxiliary notion, which is if I've got two terms in my algebraic theory, um, say of arity M, then I'm going to say that these two terms are equal in the ith place of an enary operation Q if when I take Q and stick in T in its nth position, I get the same as if I take Q and stick in U in its nth position. Oh, sorry, in its ith position. Okay. All right, so that's this notation notion here. And then, so Peter's characterization says that an equational algebraic theory is Cartesian closed if and only if, and then maybe I'll read out the first of these conditions. For all enary operations P, there exists an emery operation Q and two families of uh, M indexed unary operations U and V and a function alpha from the M element set to the N element set such that Q lambda I U I X equals X and U I P is equivalent in the ith position of Q to V I X alpha I. And then there's another condition on top of that. So I don't expect you to understand or take in any of that. I mean, I think it's not that hard to understand. It's just kind of 
slightly mind blowing when you see it. Um, so I'm mainly showing you this to show you then the simpler characterization. So I took Peter's characterization and I simplified it a bit. So this is what you get. So this is my improvement of Peter's result. So an equational algebraic theory has Cartesian closed T models, if and only if every enary operation has a unique decomposition in the following way. I can say that my enary operation P is given by taking a hyperaffine operation. Remember those two conditions for hyperaffine. And then in each of its positions, I take my variable and I hit it with the same unary operation. Okay. And so if every operation has a unique decomposition like that, then that gives you a Cartesian closed variety. And so how do we prove this? Well, we start from Peter's characterization result. And we show that the first condition, we had these two conditions, one and two. And so I show that this condition one shows that there's at least one decomposition of this form. And then condition two shows that there exists at most one decomposition of this form for every enary operation P. And well, okay, then I put those together and I deduce that there's a unique decomposition. And the key step is that from Peter's characterization, it follows that every affine operation in one of these theories is actually hyperaffine. And once you know that, the rest is, if not plain sailing, then at least not terribly choppy sailing. Okay. All right. So we can take this a bit further. So that's already sort of uh, given us a sort of nice sort of clean syntactic characterization, but we can actually use this syntactic characterization to produce a more semantic characterization. And so we get a canonical representation of every one of these Cartesian closed theories. So how do we do this? Well, suppose we know that the T model are Cartesian closed. Then I can extract from it my unary operations. And I know they form a monoid. The unary operations of any theory always form a monoid under composition or substitution. And then I can look at the hyperaffine operations inside my theory. And in particular, if I look at the binary hyperaffine operations, then those turn out to form a Boolean algebra. And why is that? Well, a consequence of our theorem is that the hyperaffine operations always form a commutative subtheory in one of these theories satisfying this condition. It's not always true that hyperaffines form a commutative subtheory, but in our case, it is true. And therefore, we can apply a characterization result of the, the, uh, the theories of B sets. So this commutative hyperaffine subtheory gives me a Boolean algebra, namely the hyperaffine binary operations. All right. Now, our theorem implies that this B and this M together determine the theory T. And so an obvious question to ask is what extra structure and axioms do we need if we want to reconstruct this whole theory T from this B and this M? And so what really is the missing thing is just the way that we substitute these binary hyperaffine operations and these unary operations into each other. So if I've got a binary hyperaffine operation B and two unary operations M and N, then I can substitute M and N into B and get a new uh, unary operation like this. On the other hand, if I've got B and M, uh, binary, hyperaffine, and unary, then I can substitute B of X, Y into M and get a new binary operation. And because of our theorem, which says that everything has this unique decomposition, I can decompose this composite as a binary hyperaffine applied to M of something and M of, uh, M of X and M of Y. Now, a priori, this M here wouldn't need to be the same M as this M here, but you can kind of see by setting these variables the same that it does have to be the same. And so what's left is this thing here, which is a new binary hyperaffine operation. And so this is determined by M and B, so I'm going to call it M dot B. All right. And so the question is, all right, so I've now got these two extra bits of structure associated to my B and my M. And these turn out to be exactly what I need to reconstruct T from B and M, as long as I impose suitable axioms. And so here are the suitable axioms. So I'm going to define a bi-crossed pair to be a Boolean algebra B and a monoid M, such that B is an M set, M is a B set, and then those structures are compatible with each other. Okay. 
So this was considered before by uh, Marcel and Tim, who I see are both here. Uh, and so they talk about, given a Boolean algebra B, a notion of a monoid M being a B monoid. And so this here is the same as a Boolean algebra B plus a B monoid in the sense of Marcel and Tim. Okay. All right. And so these conditions are exactly what you need to reconstruct T from a B and an M. And so what this leads to is this theorem here, which says that the category of all the non-trivial Cartesian closed varieties is actually equivalent to the category of these bicross pairs. And I guess the morphisms between these Cartesian closed varieties are interpretations of theories, and the morphisms of these bicross pairs are just uh, the obvious homomorphisms. Okay. All right. Now these bicross pairs are obviously models of a two-sorted algebraic theory, but actually they're also models of a one-sorted algebraic theory. So that's sort of maybe a bit surprising. So let's see how that works. So the point is that there's a computational interpretation of these bicross pairs. So I think of M as being a monoid of total programs, and I think of B as being a Boolean algebra of tests. And so BMN takes two total programs and a test and returns a new total program, which I think of as if B then M else N. On the other hand, given a, uh, a test and a total program, I construct a new thing M dot B, which I think of as, in the sense of whole logic, as being the weakest precondition, so the weakest test, such that B holds after I've run M. And this suggests a different axiomatization of these bicross pairs in terms of partial programs. So I can consider the set P, which is a set of all pairs consisting of a total program together with a test. And I think of this as a partial program, which is if B, then M else fail. Okay. And I'm going to identify two of those partial programs if, like this, if the domain of definition is the same, i.e. this test is the same, and moreover, this condition here holds, which tells me that these total programs, when restricted to B, agree. Okay, so they might behave differently outside of B, but on B, they agree. Okay. And so we get this one sort of characterization. So these MBs correspond to Ps, and the structure of the M's and the B's gives some structure on the P's, and that structure is as follows. So it's the notion called a Boolean restriction monoid. So a Boolean restriction monoid is a monoid P, thought now of as a monoid of partial programs, endowed with a constant bottom, which is a totally undefined program, and a ternary operation like this, which takes PQR and sends it to P brackets QR. And I think of this as saying, if the program P terminates, then run the program Q, else run the program R. And that's a new partial program, okay? And there's a heap of axioms here, which are not terribly interesting, but I mean, they are quite interesting, but uh, they're not interesting for the purposes of me reading them out for this uh, talk. Um, the point is that there's not very many of them. And so this is, so I've called this a Boolean restriction monoid. So the original axiomatization of a Boolean restriction monoid looks a bit different. These have also been studied by Tim and Marcel under the name of modal restriction semi-groups with preferential union. And I quite like this axiomatization of them because it shows, as Tim and Marcel showed, that they form a variety. All right, and so the conclusion is that actually the category of these non-trivial Cartesian closed varieties is equivalent to the variety of these Boolean restriction monoids, which I think kind of is uh, slightly amazing. All right, so I've got one more slide. I'm going to close the loop. So before we talked about what the uh, varieties of B sets and M sets look like, where B is a monoid, B is a Boolean algebra and M is a monoid. So now let's go back and look at the BM sets, where I've got one of these bicross pairs BM. So if I've got a bicross pair BM, I'm going to describe to you the corresponding Cartesian closed variety. And they're going to be sets equipped with an action of BM. And so what is such an action? Well, it's just an M action together with a B action such that there's some suitable compatibility between the two, which is mediated by these actions of B on M and M on B. Okay. And then how is this a Cartesian closed variety? Well, I tell you the internal HOM is just the set of uh, homomorphisms of BM sets. So the internal HOM from X to Y is just the homomorphisms from X times M into Y, 
and I have to tell you what the B and the M actions are, and those are the same as they were on slide four or whatever it was, or the B and the M set separately. All right, so in my last minus 30 seconds, I'm just going to tell you about uh, very finally about this other view that we have on these things. So these bicross pairs correspond to Boolean restriction monoids, but they also correspond under non-commutative stone duality to source atal topological categories with stone spaces of objects. Okay, and it turns out that these BM sets can also be described as equivariant sheaves on these topological categories whose support is either empty or uh, total, so things that have a global section. And so this is nice because it kind of ties this stuff in with uh, stuff considered non-commutative geometry. So for example, there are things like the, uh, the Kuntzi star algebra, which has an associated um, atal topological group with stone space of objects. And that happens to correspond to a Cartesian closed variety, which is actually the variety of um, Janssen Tarski algebras. So there's some quite nice links with non-commutative geometry there. And that's about it. So I'm going to stop there and thank you all for listening. Thank you very much, Richard.